guitarist Adrian Vandenberg. More info at fullandbloom.com. Hello? Mr. Vandenberg. Hey. How are you, sir? Ah, good, good, good. How are you? How's the connection? All right? It sounds good, yeah. Uh, do I sound okay? Excellent. Yeah, you sound like you're around the corner. You're in Holland, right? Well, now, uh, at, at the moment, I'm in France, uh, but I live in Holland normally. I like to hang out over here as well, and these, uh, in, especially in these strange times. You know, I'm, a, I'm in a very rural, weird word for a Dutch guy, a rural uh, area, <laughs> and there's no COVID in this area, actually, so it's pretty, oh, nice. pretty nice and pretty safe. Where in France is that? It's uh, in the southwest of France. It's about... Uh, um, about an hour north of Toulouse, which is uh, in the far south. So it's actually about two hours from the, um, the Spanish border. How's Holland responded to the new world? Well, it's um, a little bit up and down, you know. Uh, I think um, Holland has been doing pretty well. Um, they're keeping a finger on the pulse, uh, on the wrist, as so I speak, to adjust the, um, the regulations um, if necessary. And yesterday there were some new uh, implementations, uh, regulations Im um, implemented. Implemented. Is it the right word? Impl implemented. implemented. Yeah. That's better. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm kind of bouncing between French, English, and <laughs> Dutch at the moment. My brains are bouncing all over this place. But um, yeah, so it's um, the numbers went up a little bit last week. So then um, the government kind of tailors the, um, the rules to new situations. But um, I don't think it's too bad compared to some other countries. But it's everybody has to be you know careful and alert and hopefully abide by um, by the rules. Of course. I thought I saw something in some parts there, or is that just in England where they're going to do another round of lockdowns, possibly? Yeah, it's not in Holland. It could, it could, be, it could be in England because uh, Boris Johnson has been handling it pretty uh, chaotically. Uh, I read yesterday that they're suddenly deciding to follow the Swedish model, and but in Sweden, uh, they started differently anyway. You know, they kept the economy pretty well afloat by um, leaving it up to, uh, to personal responsibility which at one point uh, went a little bit wrong, but they adjusted it in time. And I think they've, they've done pretty well. Uh, but now halfway the situation, England... In England, um, the government thinks that they can suddenly change course, and, and that's usually not the way to go. At the same time, it's kind of hard, I suppose, because it's, it's like a new situation, and every country seems to adjust a little bit differently. Right, yeah, I saw that Sweden, and um, I just read an article, I think a couple of days ago, that their deaths, I think, had jumped initially, but they don't even wear masks. I think they just really practice no. social distancing, and everybody is respectful of it, but um, they didn't shut down anything, and kept their businesses going. Yeah, so that's a good thing, yeah. For the economy, it's, it's, it's a lot better than um, some other countries have done. So, yeah, it's just a, uh, a little bit of a surrealistic world these days. So what's a typical day like for you nowadays? Well, at the moment, um, I'm alternating between starting to work on new songs, uh, which is kind of weird, you know, because, we, uh, as, you, uh, as you know, we uh, released uh, a new Vandenberg album last May. Of course. And we haven't been able to tour like everybody else, so that's very strange range. It's the first time in my pretty long career by now, but at the same time, I'm a hardcore optimist, and I, I think everything is going to eventually find its course again, but so right now, I decided I might as well start writing for a new album, and by the time we can start touring again, which will hopefully be March, April, because there's a pretty extensive European tour planned. Hopefully, that can go through. It's really hard to predict, but if not, we might as well uh, release another album somewhere next year. Wow. Was there ever a thought of possibly delaying this last release 2020 yeah yeah absolutely um so uh, when we talked about it we came to the conclusion that everybody and his grandma is delaying their release so we decided just to go ahead and and, and put it out uh, which also for the reason that you start realizing a lot, lot of people are home and um, uh, probably lis listening to more music than they normally do when they spend most of the day at work so we thought it would be like a nice thing for people to be able to listen to a new hard rocking record and the other thing is um, the way it was projected back then, I'm not sure um, how it's going to happen right now, but it looked like everybody was going to release a, a, a record after the summer, September, October, which is now. <coughs> this was I just had a handful of peanuts right before we started, so <laughs> I'm scraping my throat every once in a while. It's not corona. But um, yeah, so um, we thought it was a good thing to, to go ahead anyway and see how it goes. Um, the good thing is that once we start touring, that um, the, the new record has sunk in instead of starting to tour while probably a lot of 
people who are coming to the show are not familiar with the album yet or maybe just like a week or a couple of days or whatever. So we had the feeling that, that there were a couple of advantages of releasing it just uh, as planned. That was the plan, though, to be on tour right now, supporting the album? Yeah, normally we would have started with an English and Scottish tour in November, December, but obviously, you know, that can't go through, so we were headlining a festival in England which is postponed to next fall, so, uh, in, you know, autumn 2021, and that's... Um, that sounds pretty futuristic, you know, it sounds like a sci-fi <laughs> situation, but then again, it's in the air. So you have moments that you, that you think you're in the movie Back to the Future without having auditioned for it. Oh, I know. It's kind of weird. I often will think when I'm at the grocery store and everybody's wearing a mask, if you could have gone back to, say, January and just got to see the a little glimpse of the future, you'd be like, what the hell has happened, yeah. you know? <laughs> In, indeed, I was in Spain two weeks ago, and over there it was already, it, it was a little bit worse than, than in some other countries, so people were obliged to wear a mask inside and outside, and that was pretty weird to see people walking outside with a mask on, and as far as I know, and what I read about it, it's really, really, really hard to infect somebody outside when you're outside in fresh air, but at the same time, I guess by now, we, we're getting to realize that you can be cautious enough, because the situation is still going strong. Aren't you also uh, an accomplished airbrush artist? Well, yeah, that's pretty funny that uh, people um, have been talking about airbrushing ever since the first couple of Vandenberg albums, but those were actually oil paintings. Oh, wow. But at the time, I loved to paint as realistically as possible, but then picture a non-existent situation so there's basically a little bit like a mixture of american super realism and um, surrealism but by, uh, you know right now since um photoshop is there since about 20 or 25 years it's uh, a little bit less fun to really realistically paint uh, non-existing situations so i haven't painted in that style for quite a while now are you painting right now at all and uh, not yet but uh, i'm definitely planning to to pick up the brushes and uh, start throwing around um, some paint um, somewhere in the next couple of weeks i'm starting to make miss it and I have been able to do it for quite a while. Um, my life has just been, you know, gone a little bit weird because I went to um, University of Arts in Holland. When I finished, I thought this is going to be my life and I'm, I'm going to play in rock bands as a hobby. And then it turned around unexpectedly and I was still thinking, well, when Vandenberg um, suddenly scored a hit single in 1982 with Burning Heart in the States and Japan and all over Europe and stuff, I thought, well, this is probably going to last a year and then I'm going to go back to painting, you know, and <laughs> I've never gone back basically uh, because it just kept rolling. So it always makes me think about the John Lennon quote, uh, life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. When you were an art student, you're living with your parents and uh, it was at their house that burned down? No, no. It, um, I, I studied in, um, in another city. In oh, okay. Barnum, I thought there was an hour away from. There was like a story um, where it burned down so, and you lost all your paintings and guitars. True. Yeah, that's true. And um, that's when I went back to live with my parents for for like a couple of months until I um, got back on my feet again because I was right before some really important exams and all my paintings burned. Plus my favorite friend is Stratocaster and all my records, you know, all my vinyl records and tape recorders and clothes and everything. So I had nothing left. And actually, the only thing I had left was my car because I wasn't home. And I actually considered just driving on to Spain or France and and do whatever I felt like doing because there was nothing left. When I went back home with my parents, I came to my senses and I thought I'd better finish my art education and then at least I have a diploma which I can do something with. And is this what inspired the song Burning Heart? You would think so, yeah. No, actually not. You know, Burning Heart is about a, um, a situation about a love relation that broke up and um, the person, the me person, who's, you know, uh, who the song is, who's basically singing the song or the lyrics has got a bad case of jealousy he or she is left with a broken heart and he wonders whether it's the same with the guy or the girl who's with your ex so yeah it's, it's definitely a jealous situation trying to realize that the thing is over what do you remember about writing that song coming up with that intro do you remember anything about that it was actually a um, most of the song I, I, I wrote behind the piano at my parents home when I was living with them for a couple of months um, in my art academy situation I remember uh, 
that I had that guitar intro, that acoustic guitar intro somewhere, and they kind of fit together uh, very well. And then they started blending uh, all the way through the song. So it, it came together very naturally. And I found over the years writing songs that usually the songs that come together in a, in, in a natural flow are usually the strongest songs. When I started writing again for Vandenberg's Moon Kings, my, my former band that I started about six years ago, I hadn't written any rock songs for at least eight, nine years. And um, I remember that my favorite songs were the songs that came together naturally. So I, I found a way to zone out um, too much thinking when uh, when I write songs and try to go as much as I can with like a natural flow and um, the stuff that feels right instead of what I used to do in the early Vandenberg days. Um, I had a tendency to add kind of sophisticating, sophisticated chord changes. And sometimes I had the feeling that it turned into art for art's sake. And that's something that shouldn't be in rock and roll, I think. With Moon Kings, I found that intuitive way of writing songs again. It probably helped that I didn't write the songs for a long time. Now, I know the success of Burning Heart labeled you as a guitar god, because I remember even thinking that as a kid, even when I saw you in the video for Still of the Night, because, you know, news didn't travel as fast, but I was already a White Snake fan, and I can still remember kind of pointing out, oh, that's definitely Tommy Aldridge, and then we're like, holy crap, that's Vivian Campbell, and honestly, I think I thought that you were still John Sykes, like the, the word hadn't traveled, so I just just assume yeah, that, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people thought it at the time because um, we do, uh, apparently, uh, you know, we, we have the long blonde hair and stuff, so we look a little bit alike. A lot of people thought so, and it was quite a, quite funny because John and I have never met, and, and we changed places twice because um, in the 80s I was asked to join Felizzi and, uh, in England, and I went over for about a week. Uh, when I talked to my dad on the phone, he advised me to finish my art studies first, which I did. So I didn't join and, and went back to Holland, finished my art studies, but John Sykes joined. And then when David didn't want to work with John Sykes anymore, uh, halfway the, um, the 1987 album, I came in. So that's when we swapped right. places again. So that was kind of weird. Didn't Coverdale even try to recruit you in the band before Sykes came in? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, David and I met for the first time in, in 1982 when the Vandenberg album was just out, like, about a week or something and David invited me to come to a White Snake show in Utrecht in Holland and after the show we uh, we talked and he said are you happy with your band Vandenberg and I said well yeah because we're just getting started as much as a fan as I already was especially of David you know I just signed a record contract with Atlantic and I just put the band together we just made a record I couldn't sell it to myself to jump out again and let the whole thing crash and also what was really important to me personally was that um, White Snake was already getting known a little bit of a lot of uh, lineup changes and I thought it would be a good thing when I eventually joined David because we had a, a, an instant chemistry on a personal level. I knew we were going to work together sooner or later. So I thought it would be a good thing to first prove something myself instead of an unknown Dutch guy joining Whitesnake and you never know what's going to happen. So that seemed to work out well because David stayed in touch. And every I think he asked me once or twice before until I finally joined in 1986. I was watching some videos of the two of you guys together and you just seemed like really great friends yeah we are you know it was like a an instant connection and um, we spent so much time together on the road and i stayed at david's house very very often for very long periods of time when we were writing songs you know so we, we used to hang out and play records and, and make um, compilations at the time on cassettes and on cds and stuff um yeah we, we've always had a strong connection almost like a brotherly connection so that was a bonus when you spend so much time on the road and especially writing together because the only time I've ever written together with anybody was with David. When I started with Vandenberg Moon King uh, six years ago, I wrote all the songs and the lyrics myself, just like this Vandenberg 2020 album. I got used to writing with anybody else, but since the connection was so strong with David, it felt very natural. And regarding your writing, yeah, I mean, you did music and lyrics on all three of the early Vandenberg releases as well, right? Yeah, exactly, and yeah, yeah. When you're writing, I'm assuming you you probably start with a guitar idea or maybe a piano idea and then are you actually coming up with the vocal melody as well or do you let the uh, singer kind of hammer that out well yeah you know when I start writing on piano and guitar mostly on guitar lately again um, with ballads I have a tendency to go 50-50 you know 50 uh, guitar uh, for some reason and because it's handy to be able to play a melody with your right hand um, while you play the chords with your left hand um, yeah when I start with a song usually it feels like I'm sticking out an antenna and all the melody kind of pops in and, and, and a lot of the 
the words as well, you know. So when I'm writing, when I'm working on the music first, usually um, some words or sentences pop into my mind and I write them down or I burp them into my iPhone so I won't forget them later. And when the song is ready, then um, I... I find the words and, and the sentences that I came up with earlier, and they usually seem to make sense, and they definitely work with the music vibe-wise, and which I'm a li little superstitious in that respect. That I think, well, there's a reason why those words came in. They, they apparently they have the like the vibe of the the music that I'm working on at that moment. So for me, it's always been a little bit of a semi-mysterious thing, you know. So um, I avoid it to overthink too much about how the process works because I'm always afraid that I'm gonna disturb it, just let it flow, basically. It's kind of like like tapping into something, huh? Yeah, exactly, because the music is supposed to be an emotional thing. I always think if you overthink too much, then it becomes more of a mathematical thing, and, and it, it runs the risk of, of starting to sound like thought out and, or, or planned or something, you know, which may work for a pop song or even for uh, classical music, but for rock, if the vibe isn't there, if the fire isn't there and, and the dynamic and stuff, then it doesn't mean anything to me. It's definitely a vibe thing. The new album features uh, Ronnie Romero, who's made quite a name in in a short time when you're writing and you have the songs does he kind of help with some of the melody or sing straight what you came up with well th yeah this far uh, that's the way it kind of went apart from the fact that when we're in the studio Ronnie and I have uh, made demos first of course and I explain I hum the melody to, uh, to him the melody that I have in mind and he puts his own stamp on it of course because he's a very emotional singer so um, that's I think apart from his great voice um, I think that's a very important strength is how he puts his whole heart and soul into a vocal performance and for me this sets him apart from a lot of other singers where you can have like a vocalist that, that's got a, a really good voice that, that's very appealing but at the same time um, he or she may sing it like it's a piano or something like uh, just just sing a melody like like they do in musicals and stuff and, and that doesn't do anything for me and Ronnie like I said he puts his heart and soul in it in that respect for me he, he's on the on the level of the great rock singers you know like Robert Dill and Paul Rogers and Steve Perry you know all those guys who sing from the heart and from the soul, that's what Ronnie does. And that's obviously um, an important reason why he became known so quickly out of the blue, you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I imagine he's just a monster in the studio. Is he pretty quick when he's working? Yeah, he is. You know, and we, we were pretty well prepared. And with Ronnie, I have the same thing that I have, a similar thing that I have with David and, and with the singer for Moon Kings, who became a good friend of mine, Jan Hoving. He's a fantastic singer as well. We worked with for the last five years. Um, with Ronnie, um, we also had an instant chemistry and I think for me, that's the most important thing because if I don't have a personal click with a singer that I work with, then it doesn't make any sense for me to go ahead because you're trying to put across emotion and dynamic and like a, a feeling. So if you can't relate to each other as far as um, what you feel with, with a certain song, you get like an empty shell of a formulated thing, you know? Does he have a system how he likes to work in the studio? Does he kind of sing it a few times and then build a vocal or does he just like to cut it straight through? He starts and has already sounds great because he prepares very well. Basically what we what we did in studio with a fantastic American producer Bob Marlette uh, from LA who we had an instant connection with as well so it worked out really great and very quickly actually. Ronnie stands in front of the microphone and then he closes his eyes and he really focuses on what he wants to get across emotionally and bam he starts to sing and then the sound comes out of his mouth and like for instance when we recorded Burning Heart in Madrid uh, which was originally not even meant to be in the album but it was supposed to be like something to put out with the press release so people would know that Ronnie and I were working together and we're going to put out a record but when we recorded Burning Heart Ronnie did two takes and it, that was it he just sang his heart out and I had goosebumps all over again and I must have played the song a million times by now <laughs> right. so for me it was a new emotional um, death that it um, gained by Ronnie singing often when people will redo a song especially with a different singer but even with the same singer it doesn't come out right but um, god almighty I'd listen to that it uh, sounds phenomenal I, yeah I agree, you know, it was very interesting because like I said, I played it so many times with Moon Kings, we played it so many times as well live, and um, we actually recorded an acoustic version of it, and Jan sang it his way, and Ronnie sings it his way, and um, so what I did, um, as people will notice, I st with the solo, I stuck very close to the original solo, apart from the fact that the first part I did on an acoustic guitar, and then I went into the electric bit, and I, I stayed really close to the melody of the original solo, but um, with 30 years of emotional experience, so for me personally, 
mentally, it, it has a different emotional content because, of course, you live and learn uh, over the years and you get into love affairs and breakups and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And that's always when I play, I, uh, I play from the heart, uh, whether I play the same solo like I do in Here I Go Again every time I'm, when we play that. I basically play the same solo, but every time it's different for me because I feel it differently. I kind of compare it with, for instance, a classical pianist or a classical violinist who plays a composition from a few hundred years old, but you never play it exactly the same, although you play the notes that are very close to the original one. I thought it was very interesting as well that Ronnie said the first album that made him want to sing was the White Snake album, Starkers in Tokyo, which was just you and David doing an acoustic right. release for Japan. And that was very interesting because um, Ronnie didn't even tell me that very first time when we met. Um, when Ronnie and I spent about a week and a half uh, in, in LA um, and shared an apartment over there um, close to the studio, um, one day, uh, like the second or the third day, Ronnie said, I'm going to tell you a secret. I said, oh, come on. And then he said, the reason why I started to sing is when I heard Starkers in Tokyo. And for quite a while, he didn't even realize that Whitesnake was a hard rocking band because the first thing he heard was just that acoustic thing. So he thought David and I were just acoustic, like a duo or something. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. You know, he was in his late teens. So, right. And, and he, he lived in Chile, in South America. So he wasn't fully aware of all that stuff. Sure. Is Bob's studio still in Woodland Hills? It's, it's actually, um, is it, yeah, it's Woodland Hills. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, it is. And yeah, we had a great time. You know, he's got um, a very comfortable studio uh, built in his garage. Very cozy, to use an English word. And um, it just feels, uh, actually the drums, we recorded the drums in his kitchen because his kitchen sounds great for drums. And um, his son, Chris, is a fantastic drummer. So he knows exactly how to get a great drum sound in the kitchen. He's kind of known to do a lot of that post-grunge, a lot of those bands. But then, of course, Tony Iommi and Sabbath and Rob Zombie. And I think he even did some Sebastian Bach. Yeah. Yeah, that was Cooper. And actually, he, he, he did, um, funny enough, he also, you know, he's, he's a very musical guy. And he's got a very wide horizon as far as his musical taste. Didn't he start out as a session guy early on? Well, the, the, the funny thing is, um, uh, he told me that, that initially when he, he used to have a band with Rudy Sarzo and Frankie Benelli, God rest his soul. You know, Frankie passed away of a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately. Um, but uh, Bob is really good friends with Rudy Sarzo. They had a band together when they were in their early 20s. Isn't that? bizarre what was the band i don't know it, it was you know a bar band like a cover band okay. just to get by and make some money it was pretty funny and rudy lives pretty close so um it was great that Rudy played a couple of tracks on the album, and also uh, Brian Titchy, right. fantastic drummer, you know, he played a couple of tracks on the album, so uh, initially I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to get the lineup together for this band, and I didn't have a drummer and a bass player yet, so I approached uh, Rudy and Brian to ask if they would like to guest on the album, and they did. So when I found Kuhn and Randy, the drummer and the bass player in Holland, Rudy and, and, and Brian agreed to um, play just on a couple of tracks. When you record at Bob's house, are you just just laying down sort of basic tracks, drums and bass and some guitar, and are, are you cutting vocals there as well? Yeah, all the vocals have been cut with Bob, and um, I finished a couple of the guitars back home in Holland. Then you just um, send them over by mail, because I, I hadn't finished all the guitar parts yet, all the, uh, the solos and stuff. Oh, okay, so basically you just took it back home and just did some solos, but rhythm, guitar, and most of the solos were cut in Woodland Hills? Yeah, partly, yeah. N not everything, but uh, most of it, yeah. Moon Kings, is that on hold indefinitely? Um, yeah, because um, the, the, the problem was with Moon Kings, you know, we had a fantastic time, but we were limited because Jan, the vocalist, who's a very good friend of mine, he's got this huge agricultural farming company in, in Holland, and he couldn't tour outside for longer than a couple of days outside of Holland. So we predominantly played in Holland, and we did a French tour two years ago and some German dates and stuff, and it was just a, a pity because we had a lot of offers from from for touring in other countries but we couldn't do it uh, and i really started missing it so i decided the best way to to deal with it is to put moon kings on ice so to speak and hopefully do like a uh, dutch tour in, in in one or two years or three years or whatever but my main focus of course now is on vandenberg because we're having an incredible amount of international attention from the states japan south america russia you name it so we're going to hopefully tour our ass off next year when when everything is back to normal I hope, like everybody hopes One thing that I saw, it looked like on a video that I watched was um, I know you did the album covers or painted them, it looked like Alibi was, uh, you had a big giant painting of it on the floor, leaning against a wall, is that the original painting? Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah yeah, um, it's true, I had well actually, um, 
uh, it's in my home studio room, and I got those two paintings. I have them uh, hanging on the wall. Wow. <laughs> How cool. Yeah, it's cool. They're, they're, they're pretty large, you know. They're about, um, let's see, about uh 35 inches by 35 inches something like that wow and that's the original they're the original paintings that you did way yeah, back yeah they are so um yeah that's quite a while ago you know and they were all oil paintings i i used to, uh, i used to paint in that style for my whole um art university time and then um, when i started touring with white snake i didn't have time to do that on the road you know because we're constantly touring or recording when i started picking up the brushes again a complete like a quite quite different style uh, came out when I painted the cover for the Manic Eden album that I recorded in 1994 with Rudy Starzo, Tommy Aldrich and Ron Young, the singer for Little Caesar. That's when I started painting again and it turned into a very different style, you know, very expressionist and very, well, to the point of almost abstract but very dynamic and sometimes I even throw the paint at the, at the canvas uh, to th see what happens, you know, and then... Like Jackson Pollock? Yeah, almost, you know, he's definitely one of my influences. Um, in my art period, in my uh, art university period, but also uh, Dutch painters like Van Gogh and um, Karl Appel, uh, Willem de Koning, who moved to America um, uh, in the 60s and became really successful as a, you know, more than, more than artist, but he's a Dutch guy, you know, like Eddie Van Halen. Every, a lot of people think he's American, but Eddie's a Dutch, you know, he moved to the United States when he was 14 with his family. Right. So, so I used to hang out uh, at Eddie's place uh, when we were recording the Manic Eden album in 94, and and with Eddie, you know, I, I just talk Dutch, and with Alex, the same thing. And Eddie and Alex, amongst each other, they speak Dutch too. When he moved to the States, it was the 1960s. And as you know, uh, like everywhere, uh, everywhere else too, language developed. Like in, in the 60s in Holland, uh, the language, different expression a little bit and different words. It was the hippie period. There were certain words that were used a lot and that are not used uh, a lot anymore now. But Eddie and Alex still use them because they speak 60s Dutch. I know it used to drive um, semi Hagen are nuts because, and Dave Rioz, really you know, because when Alex and Eddie speak amongst each other in Dutch, nobody knows what the fuck they're talking about. Apparently, Sammy um, got really pissed off because he always assumed that they were talking about him. Maybe they were, I don't know. <laughs> did Vandenberg tour with Ozzy on the Bark at the Moon tour? Yeah, we did. It was fantastic. You know, we toured for about four months in the United States, and after that, uh, I've seen Ozzy quite regularly because um, with Whitesnake, our assistant tour manager uh, has been Ozzy's lifelong best friend, you know, ever since uh, elementary school. His name was Pete Mertens, and Pete and I uh, used to, to go to Aussie for a cup of tea occasionally, you know, when we were in LA. But the tour with uh, with Aussie was fantastic because um, Jakey Lee was playing with them. Tommy Aldridge, that's actually where I met Tommy for the first time. And when Vandenberg started headlining after the Aussie tour, we had a couple of shows where Quiet Riot was supporting us. And that's when I got to know Rudy. So on the first tour, uh, I, met, I got to know Rudy and Tommy. I couldn't expect to be in the band with them a couple of years later. So it was pretty interesting how it goes. Oh, it's always weird. I've been doing interviews for about 15 years and I'm always blown away at the connections. It can be one guy has a group a connection with a certain group of guys and then those guys have a connection with another guy that the first guy had jammed with. Uh, it's just yeah. bizarre. <laughs> this big spider web where everybody kind of gets tangled into, especially, you know, once you make a name for yourself or, 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 or in a band or something or whatever, then the connections get closer because you start touring with each other, you know, either special guesting or, or headlining or whatever, and you get to know all kinds of people. That's, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about touring because I met so many of my heroes over the years, like uh, the guys from Aerosmith, and, uh, you know, the Van Halen guys. And, um, I'm assuming Michael Shanker, from, was he an influence? Well, he's, he's deaf. Well, Michael and I are, are, are pretty much the same age, um, uh, and we, we we are both from the European style of playing, so I, I've always seen a, a lot of connection with Michael as far as my choice of notes and stuff, because I was raised in a family with classical music. My sister is a classical concert pianist, and my dad used to play classical piano and jazz plan, uh, piano all the time, so our house was one big pandemonium of classical jazz and rock music. And yeah, Michael is a fantastic player. I mean... Uh, I've always looked at my, Michael as um, like the Mozart of guitar, whereas Eddie is uh, like a, a natural successor to guys like Jimi Hendrix to, to me, you know, because the way Eddie play, uh, changed guitar playing and, and influenced basically every other rock player after him. And that's pretty amazing, actually, you know, realizing oh. that. 
Right. Are those two guys kind of the guys that inspired you to play? You no, know, when I started playing, it was uh, uh, guys like Jimi Hendrix and early Eric Clapton and Leslie West and Jeff Beck. When Eddie and Michael uh, came to my knowledge, I already already developed my style pretty much, you know. And then every great player in influences me. When I feel a connection with somebody's playing, whether it's uh, you know Michael Schenker or Brian May or Jimi Hendrix or Jeff Beck or Eddie Van Halen, there's always a trait left behind I suppose that's the way I look at it because when it touches you you know when you hear whether it's a singer or a saxophone player or a guitar player to me it always leaves a trace I think somewhere in my subconscious on that Ozzy tour you became friends with Jake right yeah Jake and I used to hang out uh, quite regularly um, I actually I haven't seen him for a long 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 time the funny thing is when I started with Moon Kings pretty much at the same time Jake came out of hibernation uh, right. just like me you know we both we both <laughs> stayed away since about 1990 or something and we came back on the scene in the same year that jake with um with um, uh, his band that was in, um, Red Dragon Cartel yeah the Dragon Cartel and, um, and me with Moon Kings an interesting parallel you know right but I always thought we got, we got on great I think he's a fantastic player it's just a pity that um, he kind of disappeared for quite a while but what I read at, at one point was that he wanted to take care of his mom or something his mother was ill or something and that's um, an important reason why he kind of stayed, uh, stayed away for quite some time what was he like back then very relaxed uh, focused with his playing of course um yeah what, what, what we regularly did we had breakfast at uh, places like howard johnson <laughs> that kind of stuff you know <laughs> actually jake introduced me to, to onion rings i remember that um <laughs> i never knew uh, onion rings that was one of the things you know and and sometimes we hang out on each other to a tour bus would you jam together no i don't think we ever jammed together but i do remember it, um, a couple of times that we warmed up with um our guitars not connected, just like dry, not electric, just like like a practice guitar on your lap and, and just fiddle before the show a little bit. I have a handful of um, white snake ones, but I don't want to wear you out. I, I, I do have to go, but, but um, uh, if you want, you know, um, I, I, I'd be happy to, to do another one uh, whenever you like. Next time, I mean, there's, there's a, lot, <laughs> a lot to talk about, so it's fine with me. Very cool. I sure do appreciate your time, man. It was a real honor speaking with you. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. I'll be in touch. Great, Adam. Great talking to you. Uh, take care and be careful and be safe. Don't